Welcome to the 2023 Mundinga Lecture. It gives me great pleasure to say, to say that and to have so many of you in the room here. And I know that we've got many hundreds actually um, online. As we experienced last year, coming out of the pandem pandemic, many very terrible things, but one thing that has really taken off is the number of people that will now join these sorts of lectures um, if they're available. So, Welcome everyone in the room. I can see people from lots of different departments here. So that's um, wonderful. And yeah, hello to everybody online. Before we start um, the formal proceedings, let me um, begin with um, a land acknowledgement. Cornell University is located on the traditional um, homelands of the Gaia Kono, the, the Cayuga um, nation. The Gaia Kono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and indeed, the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gaia Kono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection between the Gaia Kono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Thank you very much. So, um, I suspect that most of you know what the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is. I hope you do. Um, might be questions afterwards. So we're a group that tries to bring together technology, science, um, education, um, and mass public participation um, to get people interested in birds and biodiversity, the science that underlies that and their conservation. So for us, public lectures like this are a bit right into the center of that, because it's an opportunity to typically to hear some really interesting um, cutting edge work but put in a broader context and having lots of people be able to answer, ask questions around that. So we really love these public um, lectures, even though it's been a few years um, since we've been able to do them. We had one last year, but it's really great um, to be back here. Now, this one is a particularly special one because this one, um, Mundinger Lecture, um, honors Paul C. Mundinger, who you're gonna learn more about in the next um, uh, few minutes. A famous um, researcher with a strong connection here to Cornell. I'm particularly pleased that um, tonight um, we have Mary Mundinger with us, Paul's, um, Paul's wife. Do you want to give us a wave, <laughs> Mary? And we also have um, Paul's um, daughter, Elizabeth, with us, who will say a few words about her father in a minute. Before I give Elizabeth the chance to do that, I'd also like to say um, I'd like to actually read out a few comments that we've got um, about Paul and about the connection to this lecture and to Cornell, which include some comments from um, Paul's son, Thomas. So just give me a few moments. I'll just, re I'll just read these out because I thought they were, I thought they framed Paul and his work and the relationship with this lecture very well. So Paul Mundinger earned his PhD at Cornell in 1967. Spent most of his career as a professor at Queen's University in New York, studying the evolution of song and song learning in finches. He was a famous professor. In a word, the goal of this lectureship, from my family's point of view, is to aspire, says his son, Thomas, who is a diabetes researcher at the University of Washington. My dad was passionate about his work in teaching people, but what he was really attracted to was getting the students to take in information and run with it to aspire to apply their work to improving the human condition. So much broader than what you might think when you think about finches initially. Paul Mundinger formed a strong attachment to the Cornell lab during his PhD work, when he spent many hours in what was then the Library of Natural Sounds, what we would now call the Macaulay Library, spending so much time there that Thomas says his only clear recollection of Ithaca as a four-year-old in the 1960s, is of looking out over Sapsucker Wood um, Pond through a spotting scope set up in what would have been then the old observatory. Today, the Macaulay Library, just last week, received its two millionth record of a sound. Amazing achievement since, since these days. And that includes over 1,500 of Paul Mundinger's original audio recordings when he, that can be played online. So there's that very deep connection um, with the lab as well as the broad concept. Going back to Thomas's comments, my dad got his doctorate at Cornell and he liked to talk about the importance of peers to students. Not necessarily your teacher or a mentor, but your peers, Thomas recalls. 
That's why this lectureship is important to us and would have been important to him. It's outside your normal discipline. It's your choice to show up this evening. And then you go home and from a talk like this and you talk to your, your roommates, inspiring people to grow. It's that word, aspire. Now that you've got the basics, go out and contribute to it, Thomas says of his father's attitude towards his students. He liked the fledglings. He liked to see them take off. So I just thought that was a lovely kind of collection of thoughts about what he, was, what he thought in his life and how that relates to why this is an undergraduate lecture and why it's intended to inspire you to go off and do great things in life with what you learn here. Okay, that's enough um, from me. Let me now introduce Elizabeth Carson. As I said, Paul's um, daughter, he'll say a few words about her father before we continue. Hello, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Carson. I'm, uh, he just talked about my brother, Tom, and, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, this lecture is in honor of my father, Dr. Paul C. Munninger. He got his PhD in evolutionary biology here at Cornell. And I really think it's great that we look at birds here with evolution because they really play an important role. I mean, they've been around since the dinosaurs. Unlike other animals, they've been able to fly to other continents and to fly to other islands where they intermingle and change and do things differently while other animals were isolated. So it's really a great research um, animal um, to look at birds and what they've done over time. Um, and, you know, birds have been very important to my family. I still remember my father um, going out and doing the recordings with these huge umbrella-like um, uh, tape recorder microphone and, and going up into the trees and people looking at him like, is, does, is that a weapon? And really worried that it was some sort of gun or something. And he's like, no, I'm just recording the birds. <laughs> um, and then growing up, you know, I was able to feed some of the baby birds that he was um, raising for research. I also joined him in um, studying some of the sonograms he did. He was raising um, house finches, but um, putting these house finches to be raised by canaries to see if they would sing the song of the canary or would they sing the song of the house finch. You know, how much of it is genetic, how much of it is your environment and language and communication, really interesting things. And, and you know, I, I love that there are hundreds and hundreds, I guess, 1500 tapes that he's made here at the Lord Lab of Ornithology. And if you go in and listen to them, which you can do online, you can hear his voice, which pulls at my heartstrings because I miss him terribly. Um, but it's great that all those tapes are there. And, um, you know, this, this interest in birds has even been passed down to my daughter. She's currently in vet school. She interned at the largest um, wildlife animal hospital in the nation this summer, and she was in the bird department because she really likes birds more than any of the other animals. So this interest has really been passed down the generations, which is wonderful. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from Dr. Regina Macedo and hearing about what's happened with the blue-black grass quit. It's just great to see that you know, research and what everybody's doing and to really think about what it means in your life and how things may change for you, hearing about these inter interesting things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Really nice to hear from you directly about your father and those family connections. Okay, um, now let me introduce somebody that most of you in the room will already know, Mike Webster, Professor Mike Webster. He's the um, Engel Professor in the Department of um, Neurobiology and Behavior, and he will introduce today's speaker. Over to you, Mike. Great. Thanks, Ian. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth and Mary. Elizabeth, those are um, so really nice thoughts, so thanks for sharing those. Um, it is my great pleasure today to be able to produce, uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Regina Macedo, who I can, I'm happy to say has been a friend of mine for many years. Um, and to just before I, I call Regina up, I want to give just a little bit of a glimpse of some of who she is and what she is, so you have an idea of, of who you're hearing from. So Regina is currently uh, on the faculty at the Universidad de, uh, de Brasilia in, in Brazil. Um, and that actually is where she started her academic career, more or less. She got her undergraduate degree um, from that same university. Um, then went off to Oklahoma, where she got her PhD in 1991, um, studying animal behavior. 
and then worked her way back down to Brasilia to take up her position where she is now. Um, Regina is an incredibly accomplished researcher. She has well over 100 um, peer-reviewed publications. She's authored or co-edited five different books on the behavior of neotropical animals, in particular neotropical birds. Um, she is, um, has been an associate editor for several um, scientific journals herself and also served for several years as the president of the Animal Behavior Society, which is the largest professional society of people who do research on in animal behavior. Um, and because of all of those accomplishments, she's been, uh, she's received several different awards from various societies. Um, she is a fellow of the Animal Behavior Society and also of the American Ornithological Society. Uh, in 2020, the American Ornithological Society bestowed upon her the William Brewster Memorial Award, which is an award that is given annually to the author or co-authors of the most meritorious body of work on birds of the Western Hemisphere published during the preceding 10 years. So that's it's, it's the um, AOS's highest distinction for research. In 2021, she was awarded the Alexander F. Sketch Medal from the Association of Field Ornithologists, and that's an award that recognizes career accomplishments of people who have done extensive research and have greatly contributed to our understanding of the life histories of neotropical birds. So, so Regina's done a lot as a researcher, but I have to say, because I, I know many of her students personally, that what she's accomplished as a researcher um, pales in comparison to what she's done as a mentor. Um, she's, she's been the mentor for, I counted on her CV, um, uh, 21 PhD students and 33 different master's students and countless numbers of undergraduates, many of whom have gone on to, to great careers in research themselves. Um, and I think it's no small exaggeration at all to say that, that Regina is really spearheaded the science of animal behavior in Brazil and other parts of Latin America. Um, and I say that because she really has at most one degree of separation for most of the people in South America who are doing this sort of research. Many of them were her students and those who weren't directly her students are students of her students now. Um, and so it's really been amazing to watch that, that happen um, over the years and see so many people with those strong connections to Regina who are out there doing amazing work themselves these days. Um, I guess I also want to mention that Regina has um, several um, strong connections with Cornell, like Paul Mundinger, and she has some uh, very good strong connections with Cornell. Um, she has sent several of her own students here um, for training in bioacoustics and genetics um, so they could complete their own projects and be, become part of the Cornell and Lab of Ornithology family. Um, she helped the Lab of Ornithology um, conduct several different sound recording and bioacoustic analysis uh, workshops in Brazil. Um, she spent a sabbatical here in 2019, so is familiar with Ithaca and Cornell through that. Um, and so I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to um, uh, welcome Regina back to Ithaca. Um, and before I call her up there, I also want to point out that she, in all the science stuff aside, she's also an incredible painter. And I'm, 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 I'm proud to say I have three of her paintings hanging in my house. So with that, please join me in welcoming Regina Macedo back to Ithaca as this year's Paul C. Mundinger Lecture. Can you guys hear me? OK, good. Um, first of all, thank you, Mike. That was an awesome uh, introduction. Uh, amazing. He made me sound so good. Just, you know, thank you. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be here. It's such an honor to have been invited to present this talk for the Mundinger Lectureship. Uh, I'm so excited to be back here in Cornell. And they tell me this is the most beautiful time of the year. And I can readily believe that it's been incredibly uh, wonderful to, to drive up from New York to, to Ithaca just to see all of you know, the beautiful trees. Not only that, but it appears that the weather has really been very uh, collaborative this last week, apparently. It's welcomed me back here, so I'm, I'm very happy for that. Um, I haven't spoken English on a day-to-day -day basis for the last well, four years, I guess, since 
since COVID, but I've been able to brush up on it the last two days. So hopefully I won't stumble too much over, over my English. So if I do, well, forgive me. Anyway, okay. So if you guys have anything, if I uh, do something here that you don't understand or whatever, just go ahead and say it, okay? If I mess up with the, with the slides, but I think it should be okay. But before I start, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my connection with Cornell, aside from what uh, Mike and, and, you know, talked about. Um, some 30 years ago, when I was starting out as a researcher in Brazil, and I was working on a little known bird at that time, the Guir Cuckoo, and um, I'd sent off one of my first papers to the journal of Field Ornithology, and it was just sort of like a short note. And of course, without my knowing it, it was sent off um, for, for review to none, none other than uh, Dr. Steve Emlin, whom I'm sure all of you know. Of course, I didn't know it at the time, but I was very surprised. A few days later, I got a personal letter from Steve Emlin, and at that time there was no email, so this came over, you know, uh, regular mail. And uh, this is the letter, and then a picture of myself with Steve Emlin many years afterwards. In this letter, he encouraged me to continue my research with a Guir Cuckoo. He also sent me several of his reprints and just was very, very, uh, very incredibly nice, actually. And I was so amazed that this world-known researcher, Dr. Steve Emlin, from you know Cornell, which is one of the best universities in the world, had taken of his time to write to an unknown researcher in, in the middle of Brazil, that I was so taken with this that I've kept this letter all of the last 30 years. And so here it is. And then many years later, I uh, met none other than somebody that you guys also uh, know very well, uh, Mike Webster, and here he is in two very special moments, um, being Mike, you know, Mike being Mike. Um, I'm in a ski lift with him at one point, and he was obviously being Mike the way I know him. And also this is when he met uh, my dog down in Brazil. And um, Mike can tell you about that if you ask him, right? <laughs> Anyway, uh, and after that, we established, uh, beyond our friendship, we established a really great uh, collaboration. And so Mike came down to Brazil a few times, like he said, for the workshop. I sent several students up here to, to Cornell. And so this has been a really uh, wonderful collaboration. Okay, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, the story that I'm going to tell you about, like most other uh, biological research, obviously, rests upon uh, Darwin's uh, theory in general. But particularly, um, what I uh, like specifically in terms of uh, Darwin's um, theory is the intersection between natural selection and sexual selection is the intersection between uh, these two forces sometimes shapes particular behaviors and ornamentation and um, sorts of displays that I became interested in. So it's the interface between these two forces that I became interested in. Okay, something. So I want to tell you how I started my work with the blue-black grass quit. And that was over 20 some years ago. And like I said, I was working with the Greer cuckoos at that time. And they nest in very tall trees, 15 to 20 meter trees. And on, at one point I was climbing up the tree to look at a nest and I decided to take a break and I sat on a branch. And as I sat there, I saw this little black speck moving in the distance on a fence. I whipped out my binoculars, I looked at it, and sure enough, it was a blue black grass quick. Not surprising because this is um, it's a very common bird in the region where I lived. And as I looked at this bird, I thought to myself, well, you know, it's such a, a cool little bird, but surely it's been looked at by so many researchers before because it has this incredible uh, displaying behavior. So I went on to look at the Grikuku nest and forgot all about this. And then a few days later, I remembered this moment and I decided to go and look up some of the research that might have been done about this bird. And when I looked up at this research, um, I found actually very, very little that had been done about this bird. And here is one of these uh, publications that I found. And this publication in 1985, I believe, yep. Um, there was a description where um, Weber said, each time I found many grass quits displaying in a dense congregation unlike anything described to date. 
In some ways, this congregation resembled a lek. But in the same publication, he also mentioned the fact that there were other researchers that had found this to be a territorial bird, a few other uh, publications. And so I looked them up, and here's another one by Murray, and he also mentioned um, Miller and Davis, who'd observed in short observations, actually, they'd observed blue-black grasswood males feeding the nestlings, and so they assumed this was a territorial bird. But these were all very superficial, very short descriptions, because these researchers came to the Neotropics for brief amounts of times, and so they only had these very superficial descriptions. And that's when I said to myself, you know what, this is such a cool bird. I really would like to study this bird for several reasons, but particularly the fact that they nest like only about 40 or 50 centimeters off the ground sounded like a very attractive option to me at that time. And so I said, hey, you know, I'll start looking into this. So um, before I go on, I'd like to say that this research conducted over the last 25 years was done with a lot of help and particularly the students that I had in my lab over the last 20 some years that worked on several facets of the Blue Black Grass Quit project. So here are their names and here are their faces. And in addition to them, I also had um, some really uh, wonderful collaborators uh, in many parts of the world. And so here on the left hand side, Diego Gil from Spain and the late um, Jeff Graves from Scotland, on the right-hand side, Mike Webster, whom you all know, um, Rui Oliveira from Portugal, and also Jeff Potos from quite nearby, from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. So all of these researchers worked at, you know, in some aspect of, of this research over the years. So let me introduce you now to uh, a very special little bird that I've enjoyed over the last many years. So like I said, this is a neotropical bird. Um, its range extends from around Mexico to southern Brazil and also Argentina. So it's a well-known bird over there. Um, they're highly dimorphic. So you can see here, the, let's see if I can make sure that I point here. Yeah. So um, the males, you can see, uh, acquire this black plumage just previous to the breeding season and it's a glossy black plumage, and the females have a cryptic gray plumage. Uh, they're socially monogamous, and so very early on in our research, we found that indeed the males defended their territories, and uh, both of them constructed nests and so on. So they're socially monogamous. And the fact is their territories are so incredibly small, only around 13 to about 70 uh, square meters. And because they aggregate these territories, that's why people assume they might be, you know, a, a lecking species, although we quickly found out that wasn't the case. So, um, like I said, um, they're socially monogamous, and some people here might have seen grass quits down in Brazil whenever they've been there. They're very conspicuous birds, at least the males are. They're socially monogamous. But in the region where I work in central Brazil, the males arrive first, so they don't live there year round. They uh, migrate, we assume, and probably from with eBird, you can all probably find out, but they uh, migrate there, we assume, from northern South America, from the Amazon. And they arrive oh, around November, December, and the males arrive first. They start doing their leaping uh, display and set up their small territories. And then the females arrive a few days later. Now, they both build a nest together. The female lays her eggs, two to three eggs, usually. And only the females incubate the eggs. And then about 10 days later, the, the nestlings hatch. So uh, just the female incubates. And both parents feed the nestlings. And it's pretty equal uh, parental investment. Both males and females care for the nestlings. And then about 10 days later, after hatching, um, the nestlings fledge. Now, one of the curious things that we noted early on, that despite investing so heavily in, in the parental duties, throughout the whole nesting cycle, um, the males continue doing their leaping display. So uh, that was something that was curious to me right from the beginning. So the other curious thing that I thought was that despite the social monogamy, I was very suspicious of how highly ornamented the males were. 
So here you can see the transition. They arrived sometimes uh, in central Brazil with this sort of mottled uh, gray and black plumage, and then the males uh, changed their plumage completely to the black, completely black, a sort of iridescent plumage. Now, um, not all males acquire the complete black plumage. Sometimes you'll see males that sort of, uh, have, you know, don't acquire the complete plumage. And the other interesting thing about it that people might not think is very important is the fact that they have these white underwing patches. And you might think, well, you know, you don't even see these white patches. The bird is perched there, you don't see the white patches. Except for the fact that when the male leaps up, you really do see the white patch because it's sort of like a white blur that you see when it's sleeping. And so for those reasons, I thought, well, this, is, uh, this might be something important, the white patch in itself. But let me show you a little bit about what the display looks like. So this is what you would see if you looked out in the, in the field. And I could ask you, well, what did you see? Really? Right? When you look out in the field, it's sort of like black popcorn popping up and down. And well, yeah. And so what else? So we couldn't say much about it except for the fact that we finally got some good funding and we were able to obtain some good uh, video equipment and we were able to film them and then slow down the sleeping behavior so we could see what they were actually doing. So I'll show you what they were doing now and I'm gonna ask you questions afterwards so you pay attention. What is it that they're doing, right? Okay, let's see if I can get this to, no? Yeah, here, yeah, yeah. There it goes. Okay, so here goes. So, what is it that they did, right? I mean, could you tell exactly what they did? So if I ask you how many times did they, these birds, how many times did they beat their wings? When did they start um, singing? What was their body position like? Because these are all important factors when you look at a display. So if you look at it again, you'll notice, first of all, that it's like about eight wing beats and that at the top of the leap, they tilt their body downwards so their beak is pointing downwards and they actually start singing at the top of the leap. And if you're close enough to these birds, you'll notice you can actually hear it. They clap their wings behind their back and you can actually hear that sound. So all these things became important and it's something that we call the multimodal signal because they're transmitting several kinds of information. So they have the iridescent coloration, they're beating uh, their wings in a certain way, they're flashing those white patches you know, beneath their wings, and they're also singing. So it's sort of in a really acrobatic leap, quite athletic. I, I, I saw how difficult and also how incredibly beautiful that was the thing. So we started asking questions about uh, the whole bird biology of the species and the reasons why they do uh, these uh, multimodal signaling um, leaps and what does it all mean in terms of the, the, the mating behavior. So in terms of uh, natural selection, we asked questions that had to do with a lot of things, but here I brought uh, some information about two things primarily, uh, predation and how it might affect some of these things. And also we chose, I, I chose actually, one aspect that we studied uh, concerning their habitat to, to look at. And then uh, relative to female choice, so this is the intersection that I was saying between natural selection and sexual selection. So here I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we did relative to female choice in terms of what sorts of attributes might females be using when they select a male as a mate. So our field um, site is located in central Brazil. Uh, we work in what we call the Cerrado biome, which is a, a tropical savanna, and we have two field sites. One of them is located inside the university itself, so it's a, a patch of savanna within an urban matrix. And the other field site is, uh, we set it up in the research farm that our university has about 40 kilometers away from Brasilia. It's an abandoned orchard that we use and we set up a grid over there. Okay, relative to our methodology, now most of you here are probably very familiar with these methods. These are the typical uh, field methods that people use when they work with birds. So we were using um, 
this this netting and then um, banding the birds with aluminum bands, normally numbered bands, and colored plastic bands. Um, we were taking several types of morphological measurements. Among these, we use the mass of the bird divided by the length of the tarsus to uh, determine a condition index, which is basically how much fat the bird has deposited and can use as energy. Uh, we did genetic analyses to determine paternity, and we also did a lot of behavioral observations and we made recordings. So we recorded the male display, the male singing. Um, we monitor the birds throughout the breeding season to look at territorial occupation. Uh, we also looked at parental investment at the nests. So, you know, the one thing that called our attention immediately was the problem with predation, right? I think you all have a saying here. I learned many different sayings while I was here in the United States. One of them was supposedly if life gives you lemons, you're supposed to make lemonade. People seem to say that quite a lot. Well, the lemonade that we made and the lemons that we had concerned predation, very, very high levels of predation. And it was an obstacle until we re realized that we should actually study predation to see what was going on. And as an example, so in our 2013 breeding season, for example, we had, oh yeah, 148 nests. But of these, only about 16% had any, uh, you know, 16% of the chicks survived, quite low. So predation was over 80%. So you might think that's a really bad thing, but you know, on the other hand, if you look at it in a, from another angle, it might be a really interesting thing. So um, this is what a typical predation event looked like. So what you'll see coming to the nest is a smooth-billed ani, and it grabs the chick by the neck and goes off with the chick and like in most nests, within a few minutes, it would come back and grab the second nestling and then the third nestling if there was a third nestling. So you'd think that a, you know, a nest that is only like about, oh, I don't know, 40 centimeters off the ground, the worst predators might be snakes or rodents or whatever, but no, the worst predators that we had in that area were avian predators. And so among them, I'd say smooth bildanis, and my previous bird, you know, that I worked with, the rear cuckoos, and a curl-crested jays. So we thought about it for a while, and we thought, well, you know, how do these birds actually find the nest? Because when um, they're really cryptic, you look through the field, you have to find the nest, they're terribly small, hidden among the bushes. And then we thought, well, they must find the nest the same way we find the nest. And how is it that we find the nest? Well, we look out in the field primarily, and where we see a male leaping, that is where the nest is gonna be. And sure enough, if we go there where the male is leaping, we look around, we find a nest. So they're not that hard to find. So we figure, yeah, yeah, that's how predators find the nest, right? But we can't just say that. So we decided to do a little experiment to find out how these predators were actually finding nests and what was going on. So we designed a very simple uh, experiment in the field, and what we did is we set up half of the nests. We have artificial nests set up with two quail eggs. We set those up where males were displaying, but which hadn't yet obtained a mate. So they didn't have any nests in their territories. So we set these nests there. And for the control, we set up the same types of nests in similar habitats, but you know, no displaying male. So obviously the hypothesis here was that, well, they're gonna be finding the nests much more uh, you know, fast or in a greater proportion, those nests that were associated with males. And well, sure enough, we did find that, which was kind of nice, because not often you get the results that you're expecting. But here you can see the nests that didn't have uh, any male uh, associated with them. So we conducted these experiments in three trials, so 28th of January, 19th of February, and 12th of March, the breeding season. So you can see that these nests had almost 100% survival through the breeding season. But the nests that uh, were associated with displaying males had quite different survival ships. So uh, all of them were lower than uh, the ones that uh, didn't have a male associated with them. But something that we didn't expect, which was quite interesting as it turns out, was that they, the survivalship of these nests declined throughout the breeding season. 
So here what we thought was happening, and this is again another hypothesis which we would have to go out in the field and test in some different way, is that these predators are actually learning to make this association through the field season, not only with our nests, the artificial ones, but with the real nest. They're learning that if they look for this plain male, well, sure enough, they're gonna be able to find a nice meal, you know, and that's what was going on. So based on these uh, observations initially of predation, we thought, well, you know, there are other things that uh, related to predation that might be really interesting for us to find out. And one of them had to do with predation risk and the fact that they have such um, accentuated dimorphism. And we assumed that because predation risk could interact with the fact that they're sexually dimorphic. And that might have an effect with how parental behavior evolved. So we assumed basically that males, because they're so you know, colorful against the vegetation and they do this leaping behavior, they represent a very high uh, predation risk for the nests and the nestlings. Whereas females with their cryptic plumage, well, they represent a smaller predation risk. So we decided to go ahead and test this as well. So we did another um, experiment on the field, also very simple design. And what we had here, the experimental design, this time with real nests on the fifth day after nestlings hatched, and we set up recordings, two types of recordings. For the experimental trials, we used um, a Sayaka tanager recordings, and the Sayaka tanager represents absolutely no risk to the nestlings. And then for the predator um, uh, treatment, we use uh, recordings of the rear cuckoo. And we set up these so that we had 20 nests submitted to each type of treatment and for two hours uh, for each uh, treatment. And we used as predictor variables here, we used predation risk, that is either zero risk or a lot of risk considering the rear cuckoos, and the sex of the, pa the parent, either male or female. And for the response variables, we had eight types of parental behaviors at the nest that we looked at. So let me show you a little bit about how this turns out. Um, so what you'll see here are two types of graphs. Now, the graphs in green are associated with females, the graphs in blue with the males. And within each graph, you have on the left-hand side, you have the control. On the right-hand side, you have the predator treatment. So you can see from the lines that connect the dots what sort of, uh, how, the, how that behavior either declined or increased. So in this case over here, for example, the behavior that we had is latency to visit the nest after the, the predator treatment. And what we found is that females come back to the nest a lot quicker than males come back to the nest after being exposed to the predator treatment. So this was one difference we found in the types of behaviors expressed by the parents. Now another difference that we found was the time spent brooding, and we found that females, after being exposed to the predator treatment, they increased the time that they spent brooding, whereas males decreased the time that they spent brooding. So another difference of that type. Now one, one uh, other behavior, but in this case, I'm just gonna show you a few of them, but in this case, we found that both males and females uh, had the same response. So in terms of the feeding visits to the nestlings, both parents decreased the, the frequency of their visits to the nest. So we found several differences. But one um, behavior that we found that was just for the male and was really sort of interesting, um, in our observations, uh, because we were filming these, we found that the males frequently had a very odd behavior when they fed the nestlings, after feeding the nestlings, they would actually use a nest rim to conduct their leaping display. So they use the nest as a perch. So don't ask why they do such stupid behavior, but they do. And so we thought that was really wild, but we found that once they were exposed to the predator treatment, they were, they, they were 200 less likely, 200% uh, less likely to conduct a leap. So maybe, you know, they're less sexy when, when they don't leap, but at least their, their offspring might survive a little bit more, right? 
Okay, so I'm going to jump off to something else now. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the habitat now uh, in terms of uh, something in the habitat that we looked at. So notice that the, the grass quit is doing his leaping display and singing, right? We call that the complete display. But he might also not leap. So he might just conduct the singing behavior and not leap. And we call that the incomplete display. Nonetheless, whatever he's doing, a grass quit like that, he wants to be heard and he wants to be seen, obviously. And when you look at the type of habitat that these grass quits live in, or the name, right, grass quit says it all. They live in a grassy habitat. So it has lots of grass, small shrubs, and small trees. But one other thing that this type of habitat has that people don't really pay much attention to is the abundance of sunlight. It's very open habitat, and these birds are exposed to a lot of sunlight. So why would that be important, right? Why, so what, it's, there's a lot of sunlight. Well, we thought to ourselves, this might be really important because of signal conspicuous, conspicuousness. Um, the quality of a signal should vary quite a lot depending on ambient light. So we thought to ourselves, well, you have here the interplay between ambient light, the reflectance spectra of, of the color itself that the, the animal has, and then the movement of the animal. All of these things contribute to how well the signal is transmitted. And so if you think, for example, on um, a, an incredibly beautiful, colorful butterfly uh, in a cloudy day, well, all its colors are muted, its signal cannot be transmitted as well. On the other hand, when the sun comes out, well, you know, the butterfly signal, the, all the colors are incredibly bright and, and easily seen. So how important is that, you know, for the signal to be well transmitted? Well, we thought about that for a while, and we, th we thought that signal conspicuousness in itself has some, some big costs, because obviously, like seeing those grass quit uh, leaping, it has costs because it attracts predators, right? Um, we never measured this, but we assume it's energetically very costly to conduct these leaps. And also, there are trade-offs in these uh, ornaments and displays. So while a male might attract a female by doing these displays, he also attracts predators, so there are costs in natural selection. So we thought that considering all of these costs, that males should be smart, evolutionarily speaking, and that they should be really selective in when they do their displays. They should optimize uh, the, the signal in those windows of time when that would be most important to decrease their costs. And we also thought, well, if males, if we assume that they can do that, that would also indicate that they have a lot of uh, plasticity in conducting, uh, and they can be flexible in conducting these behaviors. So we, we assume then that direct sunlight increases the conspicuousness of, of the males because they have this iridescent plumage, and we made some predictions based on that. So we predicted that those males that were sitting under direct sunlight would increase the frequency of their leaps. And we also um, expected that of the complete displays that they would be leaping and singing. And then that when sunlight was not bathing these birds directly, they should decrease the leaping and just use the perch singing behavior. So they would decrease the cost associated with that. So we went out in the field and we measured that. So we used um, uh, periods of time of five minutes and measured sunlight bathing these birds in three points of time during the five minute intervals and looked at the frequency of the leaping during those periods of time. And we found out that sunlight incidence bathing the bird uh, directly increased uh, the frequency of the leaps. So what you can see here is that in low sunlight, um, the incidence of the leaping is about four leaps per minute, whereas in high sunlight incidence, that is in complete sunlight over the bird, they can increase to about seven leaps per minute. So they came out to, you know, doing what we had predicted in that regard. Whereas when um, you look at the frequency of the incomplete leap, it's a bit different. So you see that it peaks in the interme uh, intermediate category of sunlight incidence, and then it goes down in the highlight 
in the high category of sunlight incidence. What we think is happening here is that the males then transition into the leaping behavior when sunlight uh, is bathing them directly. So based on this, uh, this little experiment, we decided then that, well, yeah, iridescent coloration is important for these birds in some regard in that uh, it's a, a crucial part of, of, their, of their signal transmission in some way because they actually uh, can modulate this according to the amount of sunlight that they have. And the other thing is that they can transition quite quickly from one behavior to the other, which shows that they have a lot of behavioral plasticity and, and flexibility. Okay, the other thing that I mentioned, of course, is that, um, sorry, we didn't change it here. I mentioned that they want to be seen, but they also want to be heard, right? So I was not the first person to notice how cool this bird is in terms of singing when they're leaping. Somebody else who you guys might have heard of, Mike Ryan, published this paper, and I thought was the coolest name here. Um, the acoustic advantage of getting high, I thought that was pretty cute. And uh, we, we were interested in the singing behavior as well. <laughs> you can see some grins out there, yeah. A cool, it's a cool name, isn't it? Um, cute. Anyway, we were also interested in the singing behavior and what that might mean in terms of the signal uh, as, a, as part of the signal of the bird. But just to show you what this looks like, or not, hang on, there it is, okay. Um, can you guys still hear me okay back there? Yeah, okay. So it's a very short song, right? It's only half a second uh, in length, and it's only a single note, although there are these introductory elements over here, and it decreases from beginning to end of the song. And it's all, it goes from about 13 kilohertz to two kilohertz. And though it's so simple, we assume it's very important because the bird is doing it within such a short span of time and while it's sleeping. So certainly it's, it must be a difficult thing to do. And not only that, but one of the more interesting things that we also found is that each male has a unique song. And so it's like a signature song. So if you have the male and, and you have uh, the sonogram, you can actually identify which bird you're talking about because each one has a very uh, specific song. So even a small field site like the one we had, there's a lot of variety in the songs. So the question that we asked relative to uh, female choice, now leaping into the, talking about leaping, right? Leaping into the other uh, part of the uh, things that I was interested in is sexual selection. In terms of female choice, what sorts of attributes might the females be using uh, to choose their mates? And what might the consequences be for the mating system? So like I said before, um, one of the things that I found very suspicious is because of this ornamentation. Okay, so yeah, they're socially monogamous, but they do have this, you know, this leaping behavior. They have uh, these plumage uh, characteristics. And um, I guess we can explain that in, in uh, briefly here by looking at the operational sex ratio and how that interacts with mating systems. So if you look at the operational sex ratio where it's biased toward, uh, towards males, that is you have more males than females in the mating pool, and so there's a lot of competition among males to access females. In those kinds of situations, you can expect males to acquire um, more ornamentation, to exhibit more uh, conspicuous uh, courtship behaviors, and then you'd expect to have a polygynous mating system evolve, right? Now, if you have an operational sex ratio of approximately one to one, well, you, would, you wouldn't expect a lot of ornamentation. You'd expect to see a monogamous mating system evolving. On the other hand, if you have an operational sex ratio, more a rarer type of thing that happens, but uh, that's biased toward females, you'd expect a polyandrous mating system to occur. Um, Nonetheless, you could expect sexual selection to also occur in monogamous species in some circumstances. And in the circumstances that we're talking about, we're talking about the fact that some males could still monopolize females in those situations by having extra pair fertilizations occurring. 
And so in those situations, males would also be competing, but sort of under cover of a socially monogamous mating system. And then you could have, as a result of that, ornamentation uh, evolving and also elaborate courtship behaviors. So that's what I suspected from the very beginning by looking at these birds. So we ask questions about how do females choose their mates uh, in this species? And we thought, well, one possibility, right? Females might be choosing males based on their ornaments. And these were associated to indicate some direct benefits that female could acquire. So maybe males that were doing um, wild displays or whatever have better territories, better quality resources, something like that. But we looked a lot more at the types of indirect benefits that females might be acquiring. So in that regard, we thought, this is called the good genes or the sexy son hypothesis. You might be familiar with that. But in this case, we would think that the displays might be indicating to females that a male might be really healthy, a lot of stamina. So in this case, maybe females would be looking at how high the males leap or the frequency of the leaps or even song parameters, so frequency, bandwidth of the songs, length of the songs, and so on. So what did we expect? Like we wanted to go out and find some answers. Well, we thought, surely, you know, females, well, what they want, they want males that are in better physical condition, um, that sing pretty songs, enhance song parameters. And we thought that successful males then would be the ones that produced perhaps higher leaps or more frequent leaps or better quality songs. So I guess these are the expectations that if you go out in the literature, this is the kind of thing that you would uh, presume. So we set out to measure these things. And here in this case, we um, measured parameters for 53 males where we had 65 video clips of both complete and incomplete displays. So we measured for these males, we measured leap height, leap duration, rotation angle of the body. You might have uh, noticed that the, the bird at the top of the leak, it sort of, the leap, it sort of tilts its head down. Um, also, we looked at the body condition index. We had the song recordings for these uh, males. And we also had paternity analyses for, uh, these na for these males. So we had 174 nests where we were able to genotype 131 nestlings. So a lot of people sometimes will ask me, well, how were you able to measure the, the leap parameters? It was, it was just uh, difficult, but uh, not, not, uh, not difficult. Um, I say a lot of work, right? But not difficult. <laughs> um, so we superimposed the first, um, the first image in the video clip with uh, the image at the top of the leap when the bird was at the peak of the leap. And then we just drew lines from the bird's feet. Uh, and then we measured from the bird, uh, bird's beak to this line where the feet were positioned. And then used the bird's uh, head length as the ruler to measure the height of the leap. And then we drew lines that transected the bird from the beak to through the tail in both cases. And, uh, and the angle that was formed here was the angle of the leap. So we could measure that parameter as well. So. Everybody wants to know, right? What is it that females want? I uh, guess we expected to have, oh yeah, we'll find out, you know, wonderful, uh, straightforward answers. Well, not really, right? Sometimes it doesn't come out that way. But let me show you then what we got. So this table here, on the top part of the table, are the maternity analyses for three years, and I'll focus just on the totals in the red, and then in the bottom part, the paternity analysis. The first column, first column here is just the number of chicks, and then the number of extra pair uh, chicks, and the number of broods from which they came, and then uh, on the right-hand side, broods where all of the chicks were extra pair, meaning that the social parents were feeding chicks that didn't belong to them at all. And then mixed uh, broods, where you had both extra pair and within pair chicks, and then the totals. OK. So for the to here, for the totals, for the maternity analyses then, what we had is we had 127 chicks. Of these, seven did not belong to the female, the social mother that was feeding those chicks. And uh, these, all of these chicks came from 56 broods. 
Now we had two brood, no, one brood where um, the two chicks did not belong to the social mom that was feeding them. We had four broods where there were mixed chicks. Some didn't belong to that female and some did for a total of five broods. Now people might say, well, how, how can you have a female who's actually feeding chicks that don't, even, don't belong to her? That's a phenomenon that you might also know called quasi-parasitism. And what we think was happening was the male would mate with another female, and either he would show her where the nest was, or she would follow him back to the nest and parasitize the female at that nest. So at that nest, the social father was actually the genetic father, but the mom was not. Okay, so it's not a very, um, very high number here. You know, just seven is not very high. But in the case of the males, well, surprise, surprise, or maybe not, very surprisingly, there was a very, very high rate of extra pair paternity. And so we had here 209 uh, chicks overall. We had over 20% of those chicks that were extra pair, did not belong to the dad, the social dad that was feeding those chicks. And these chicks came from 95 broods. Now we had 13 broods where none of the chicks belonged to the dad that was feeding them, and 17 with mixed paternity, and then total for 29. Now you'll notice that along the three years, this varies quite a lot. So some years there's a high rate of extra pair paternity, other years there's a low rate of extra pair paternity. So with all of this, we were still we were still interested in finding out what is it that you know females are looking for in these males. So what we found was um, interesting, though not what we expected, which is okay. Um, for example, we found that um, males leaping higher were able to attract their social mates better than males that were leaping lower. But we found no association between, no relation between leap height and genetic reproductive success, which we were sort of expecting, you know, oh well, well, okay. And the other thing that we found that, here I'm just showing what we, what we didn't expect that we found, you know, this is sort of a, so we found that longer songs are not better. And your guess is as good as mine why that might be the case, but we found that the probability of a male losing paternity in his nest increased the longer his songs were. Okay. I'll be interested in what your hypothesis you might have to explain that. So we asked something else. We asked whether um, social males were different from the males that were stealing paternity from that social male's nest, because we expected the, the males that were stealing paternity to be better, right? But no. We didn't find that. We found that social males and the males that stole paternity from their nest were not different in any of the, the measurements that we made, right? But we did find something that we didn't expect. So um, we didn't expect any of this either, but something else that we found that was quite interesting but we never followed up on. We found that females with multiple matings have a higher body condition than females that are monogamous. And, you know, we tend to focus a lot on what the males are like and what they're doing and so on, and we tend to forget the importance of how the females are. And, and so this is something that we never followed up on. We found this and said, oh, this is our next research project. You know, but I'm not going to be doing it. So you're welcome to do it. Okay. So another thing that came up was the trade-offs and display parameters. And what we found is that males really cannot do it all. So we found that, for example, males um, that have a higher body condition index, they do uh, leap higher. They can leap higher. And they also spend more time leaping. So it's good for a male to have, you know, to pack in some fat to be able to do that. So just to tie up some of the results that, that I had here to show you for these things that we asked, what is it that, you know, just to summarize some of these things. So we found that, yeah, male display is a risky thing and they attract predators. We found that increased predation risk uh, changes parental behavior, particularly the male changes his behavior. Um, we found here, I'm showing you one habitat feature that we looked at that is uh, something not very often looked like, looked at, but sunlight influences male display rate. We found that display uh, height is important for these birds to obtain a social pair. 
And we found that males with a higher condition uh, body index also have a higher uh, leap, and they also leap more frequently. And finally, females that have multiple matings are in a better body condition than monogamous um, females. So uh, to tie it all together, the way that I look at this, um, I, I look at it in a sort of intuitive way. Um, when you look at this intersection then between natural selection and sexual selection. So in natural selection, you might be thinking of the resources available to the animals or the force of predation and certain habitat elements. But if you look at any of these things in an uh, isolated way, so if you only ask the question, what is it that females are interested in, what are they looking for, and you forget some of these other elements, you're not going to get, uh, uh, I think, you're not going to get the answer that you expect. Because, for example, if a female chooses only a male that is particularly, um, you know, glossy or leaping higher or singing or whatever, she's exposing her offspring to more danger. So the type of answer that you might get is not what you expect. That things are more complex than you might imagine. And um, I guess to my mind, also in a very intuitive way, I always think of nature and what I look at in these questions and answers that I get, like that little children's game, I don't know what you call it here in, in the US, but you can never pull out one little twig and not expect everything to fall apart. So it's a lot more complicated than most of us would imagine. And with that, well, I don't know what time I have and if I have time for questions, but I'd like to thank you all very much for coming, and for listening, and also for all my funding uh, sources through the years, which they were very generous. And that's it. Thank you. I don't know. Okay. Oh. You're calling it, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Good talk. Um, uh, very interesting. I'm not super familiar with the model system, but I kind of had some questions, just like a few basic questions, um, mostly about the size of the groups that they usually gather in. So we talk, talk a lot about like uh, individual courtship uh, interactions, but. Um, and you mentioned that they were common, but are there huge groups of them that all come together? How do they make their decisions? Is it something that is a little bit more complex um, than just, you know, spying the brightest male in the pack? Um, and then also, uh, do the females have any vocalizations that the males might have to pick up on, um, at, like for a feedback system or when they're making their mutual decision? Um, just kind of like, maybe they don't sing, but do they have any calls or something that are also important? Okay, so these agglomerations that we see on the field is interesting because sometimes you'll see like, um, they come in in very large flocks, uh, in my region anyway, they, they, they migrate into this region in very large flocks, and then these flocks start to break up. When I say very large flocks, like, you know, 50 to 100 birds, just going through different parts of, of the habitat. And then they start to break off in smaller groups. And finally you get groups of maybe sometimes 30 birds or 40 birds in one specific area. So they're all in their small territories cluster. And then you'll have patches of habitat that don't have any birds at all. And we don't know exactly why they might not be in these uh, types of habitat. And then you'll run another group. You'll find another group of 10 birds, 20 birds, so they're like agglomerations of, of birds. Um, so why they agglomerate in, in, in these uh, dense little clusters, I don't know, because we couldn't find any differences in the habitats. But we suspect that there is uh, advantages to being together in that sense, because of predation, perhaps. So that was, is one thing. Um, as for females, no, they, they don't sing. They have quiet little tweaks now and then that you can, you can hear, but they're really not very conspicuous at all. They stay a lot on the ground. Uh, I've never seen them mate, actually. So, yeah, because uh, they're very inconspicuous. They're on the ground, so, yeah. Okay. yeah. Why do you think that the males display from these nests instead of 
other parts of their small territories, or do you think that it's an issue of their territories being so small that the tallest spot is the tallest spot, and that's also the best spot for a nest? No, you know, the nests usually are not on the top of the bush or whatever. They're usually a bit lower on. And to be honest, when I saw this, I was just, I was outraged. Why in the heck are they leaping from their nest? Seems like really weird behavior. Either they do it from the nest or right close by, they'll, you know, hop to another little twig and then they do the leap. I think they just dying to do their leap, you know? <laughs> There's no good reason for why they would expose their nestlings to that, which is what I think. But then we did find that they decrease this very, very strongly if, if there's a predator nearby. Um, so it's not the highest point in the territory at all. So um, don't know. I think that is uh, not good behavior. It should have been eliminated by natural selection. <laughs> Maybe it will be, but uh, no. Okay. Other question? Um, when you were doing the uh, video analysis of, I think it was like the 53 males among the 65 uh, video clips, I think it was, uh, like I guess other than changing from like the incomplete to the complete uh, display, were you able to find much in the way of like variation within males, like for those different parameters, like the rotation angle and, and stuff like that? Like, did it very much within, within uh, a male? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So did everybody get the question? I'm not sure that I should repeat or not. Whether there's variation in these parameters of leaping display. Yeah. No, they're pretty consistent um, with their, you know, it would be one thing to, to look at over time. Let's say a male starts displaying in the morning, and we didn't look at that, but it would be interesting to find out whether with time they might decrease the, the leap height because, you know, they just get really tired. So you were doing these measurements with us. Uh, I don't remember how many, many measurements that we used to conduct for each male, we had uh, the parameter, the average established, let's say. Uh, but I would presume that along a day, they might decrease the leap height or the frequency just because they get tired. So we've actually seen like a leaping male at one point, he sort of fell off, like fell off the branch. And then he sort of crept up again, you know, and sat there for a while, and then he started again. So maybe through the day, he would um, make a change. Wouldn't you? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's it seems it seems like uh, something that you could expect. Yeah. Okay. You want? Yeah. Yes, please. It's kind of adding off the why males leave all the nests. Is there a reason known why they leave at all after already forming a pair? Okay. What we think is that that's the way he advertises for extra fair matings. Um, yeah, I, I think that that is probably the reason. He exposes his own nestlings, I think, to danger, but at the same time, he increases his chances of acquiring uh, other mates. So one of the things that we always think about, um, and it's like, this is like we end up, you know, one project, and there's so many questions that end up occurring that we can't answer all of them in a lifetime. But one thing that occurs to me is that why in the world would males um, put up with it, feeding, you know, so many offspring that don't belong to him? This, it, it didn't make a lot of sense to us in that way, but we think it has to do with predation. So I'm still into thinking that predation is the driver of a lot of these things. Because if a male spreads out his genes across a huge expanse, you know, he has some chances of some of his uh, offspring surviving. And he feeds, you know, somebody else's chicks, but somebody else is feeding his chicks somewhere else. Maybe, you know? Uh, I have a question kind of building off of that. So you have these kind of nesting aggregations, like they're pretty small. And because it's an avian predator, that presumably, like, do you see Ani's? with one set of 30 birds, for instance, then continuously coming back to that group? Or do they get full off of one nest and then they're like, oh, that's it for next month? Yeah. Like, terrible. Yeah. Um, we don't have like the Ani's like marked, so we don't know whether it's the same bird or not, right? But what we know is that they come back to the same nest until they've gobbled all of them up. 
And um, and the other thing is like like when a, a flock of curl crested jays comes through, you might as well call it quits because they go through and they just get all the nestlings in that area. So we tended to try to drive off the curl crested jays, particularly when they they showed up. And uh, yeah, but I think. Um, I don't think they stay in the same area and pick on the same group. I think they find a nest and they gobble it up and then they go somewhere else. But, yeah. In areas of Sahadu where there's less disturbance, so there aren't farms or like right next to the where you work, is the predation rate lower? Like are there less of those cuckoos and anis to and jays to predate the grassbirds? Yeah, uh, we can. Yeah, it, it is lower in uh, in these other areas that are more urban. Um, we have we seldom have the curl crested jays in these urban areas. We do have rear cuckoos and anis, but the more disturbed it gets, I mean, more disturbed in the sense of more urbanized, the fewer uh, anis and rear cuckoos there are. There might be other predators that we haven't really looked at, like more rodents, maybe. Yeah, but um, we find a lower degree of predation in these areas. Yeah. I guess the follow-up question then would be, in those less disturbed areas, if there's less predation that's mediating it, would you expect there to be a difference in, in the male strategy of extra pair, uh, of seeking extra pair population? It might. I mean, uh, we, didn't, we haven't looked at it, but uh, yeah, that would be a, a nice hypothesis to follow up on. So like I say, there, there's so many other questions that come up, you know. And you think, oh yeah, all these questions, and you say, well, 30 more years. <laughs> yeah, but it's good, cool. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Um, as you're talking, I was thinking not only about your really wonderful body of work presented, but also of that really wonderful body of students and, and former students who contributed to it over the years. Many of whom, as Mike said earlier, have gone into their own, their own work. And I, I'm just curious, do you have any kind of standardized advice you give to people as they're moving from your project to establish their own, be um, successful in this line of research, you know, as early career scientists doing this on, the, doing this on their own in some other system? I ask Milenia here, the former student of mine who never came back home as a professor at SUNY. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the students asked me this question, I think yesterday, the graduate students. And I think that the, the biggest key to any kind of success is to absolutely love what you're doing and to wake up every day really excited about what you're doing. And if you have that, you know, I think that is the biggest thing to, to achieve success and to be happy. And if you're not happy with what you're doing, then you should be doing something else. That is primarily what I think. Yeah. That's a beautiful place to stop right now. So please join me in thanking Regina one more time. Thank you.